Okay, so for domain four, we need to talk about all things to do with the architecture. We're going to look a little bit at the uh, threat intel side of things and distributed databases, standalone servers, that type of thing. So getting started, we can see that we've got the solution architecture here. You have the main site, um, which you'll have the main Cortex application server, disaster recovery. And then in the internet, you've got platform content updates, you've got Threat Intelligent, Prisma Cloud, Ticketing, Sandboxes, all the uh, all the remote services there. And then for uh, remote protected or isolated networks, you can use XOR engines, and we'll talk about them later, where you can run XOR integrations from in protected areas because it's only one connection back to the uh, to the main server, and actually putting them together isn't that difficult. Okay, so the first type of deployment is single server deployment. It is as the name suggests, it single server hosts a database and holds all the investigation data and the artifacts. Live backup server provides resilience, stores a replication of all files, and you can perform a manual failover in the case of failure. And distributed database. Um, so if you're in a situation where you're going to need to be able to hold a bigger database or um, you want you, you want like a larger environment you can go to the distributed database and uh, the main database which lives um, that's the first one that's created then anything that's created subsequently is called a node so that holds the content only uh, playbooks automations integrations etc all other nodes are considered secondary and hold incident data only um, a couple of things to note there, so 443 and 50001 must be open from the app server to the DB node, and 443 must be open to initially register the DB. So, the installation of the distrib distributed database, installing um, XOR or Demisto is actually fairly simple. It's all one script and then dependent upon the arguments that you put into it that you then sort of either, as you can see here, uh, install database only, server only, and so on. You get the idea. Okay, so one of the things we're gonna demonstrate a bit later on is installing the distrib distributed, uh, if I can speak, distributed database, as well as all the others. Um, so XOR engines are, they're a, another part of this and the script for it is actually created from within XOR itself. Um, these are the specs. So the idea being that if you have a very secure environment, what you can do is you can put an engine in there. So you've only got the one connection and that's spawned from a script that's created on the XOR app itself, application itself. And that then connects back to the application server on 443. And so there's never a call made into that environment everything is connected from inside out and uh, on the engines as you can see you can run integrations but not scripts and it provides encrypted outbound connectivity back to the app server um, so essentially windows linux and mac os's it allows you to run integrations in environments where you wouldn't necessarily be able to have that connectivity in from your main app server So let's talk a little bit about the, the specs that are required for XOR itself. For a production server, they, they uh, suggest a minimum of 16 cores, 32 gig of RAM, one terabyte SSD, uh, with a minimum of 3000 IOPS. Um, for a dev server, eight cores, 16 gig of RAM, 500 gig SSD. SSD is the recommended um, storage because of the nature of the database and the quick reads and writes. Um, magnetics just struggle to, to keep up and your performance will suffer. Okay, so you can add a dev server to the environment. Um, so this is a, a dev server will be a mirror of your main server, but obviously it hosts a complete dedicated repository uh, as it suggests in this slide for experimental integrations and script purposes. 
we'll go into that a little bit later as well. This is actually quite a long section, this one. Okay, now, dis dissoluble agents. There we go. Managed to get the words out. So these are created in the war room and they're deployed onto the endpoint uh, as we suggested on host for forensic purposes. Those agents then disappear, hence the dissoluble name, uh, once they've been used. So they leave no trace of themselves on the host that they were installed on. You have to explain the use of Docker in the XOR system. Uh, this is quite a, a big part of it and also plays quite a large part in the troubleshooting side. Um, because basically everything underneath runs on, on Docker instances, containers. So the idea behind Docker is used to run scripts and integrations in isolated environments to avoid any possible damage to XOR server. Uh, when creating Docker images, you can be sure that by adding libraries and dependencies, integration will run in any environment. Of course, that is pretty much Docker. That's how it works. And Palo Alto Networks uses the uh, the Docker.com um, Demisto re uh, repo, as you can see there, uh, and only that one. So we're going to backup types. So we're going to explain different types of backup options and the benefits of each one. So automated backups are taken every night at a given time. By default, I believe it's 3 a.m. Uh, however, these backups are the database integration playbooks and scripts that isn't sufficient to restore a server should you need to so to have a full backup that can act to restore the server you need to manually back up the following files as well and there's a list of the files that you need to do and we'll go into a um, a bit more about that later on um, and the, I guess if you, if you just got standalone then yeah, that's okay. I mean, you could easy, quite easily write a, a script that just backs up those. However, when you come to upgrade it, it gives you the opportunity to back them up anyway. Okay, so a live backup server provides a mirror of the production server. It's, it's a mirror, but it, you can't see it as a it's like an active active or even an active passive failover because it's not currently supported. As that suggests, the failover is not dynamic. It has to be manually initiated. And it supports active standby only. However, as I said before, that's only um, with a manual failover uh, and only two servers. The extra servers are not supported at this time. So con consideration of the failover really include how your analysts and how your uh, the, your people that are using it are going to get to it. So if they get to it through DNS, which is, of course, the way most people will, then you'd have to go for like a low TTL. So basically, if anything fails and you have to switch over to the next one, you can then change the, um, the IP that the DNS points to. But if you've got a really low TTL, then obviously, you know, you, you're going to be stuck with the amount of time it takes for the browser's cache to time out so that it then goes back and gets a new one. Um, I believe on most systems that DNS is one hour by default. So as each server retains its own IP and hostname, the failover must be manually initiated, initiated by changing the IP that the DNS points to. Uh, could potentially just manually browse the backup server should the primary fail, so you could just go uh, to that if the Analysts and everybody has the uh, both IPs or both host names. Um, although not really massively covered, uh, and unfortunately due to license restrictions, I can't do any demonstrations of it. For MSSPs, so managed security service providers and so on, there is a multi-tenancy version of XOR, which is, as it states, it's multi-tenancy. Um, so you'd have to differentiate between that and the multi-tenancy one, and it's going to want you to know basically these uh, require extensive IT resource. Data is isolated between customers. It can be shared between customers, but it is very difficult. And then basically from then on, it, it, it's all a nightmare. So DR backup and all other tasks are exponentially more complicated, but a system can scale to over 100 tenants. 
you can have shared objects, as I say, so all your tenants can then benefit from one person's um, misfortune, I suppose, but you can all benefit from data that comes in. Um, although, as I say, uh, it is a lot more difficult to put together. As f At this moment now, as of recording, um, you need a special uh, partnership status with Paolo um, to have uh, the MSSP. You're also going to have to look at the threat intelligence side of things, of course, which is a massive part of XOR. Um, as you describe threat intelligence capabilities and management of the threat data. And this is, I mean, this is pretty much standard threat data and, and threat management. So you've got your threat intel feeds, such as um, Alien Vault, um, IP Info, that kind of thing. Um, if you've ever worked with MindMeld, then you'll notice some some similarities between this and MindMeld. Uh, Cortex XDR logs and alerts, obviously that can be fed straight into XOR. Auto-focused enriched data uh, and unstructured Intel feed. So in the same way that MindMeld, the, the power behind MindMeld was to take in varying different formats and then aggregate them, put them together into a, a single consumable output. That's exactly the same here. So you can run many, many Intel feeds into it and then as you as we go further into it, you'll see how you can then merge duplicates so you don't get lots and lots of repeated indicators and so on. Um, and then using the jobs to run at night to uh, expire indicators at the right time. And then again, obviously, of course, you can use this because it isn't vendor locked to Palo Alto. It's not just specifically for ne uh, next generation firewalls. You can provide the data to SIM platforms, obviously next generation firewalls, Intel sharing, taxi and stick feeds, third party integrations, dynamic lists, and basically any platform that can benefit from the data. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into an installation uh, demonstration. So we're gonna start first with a standalone, and then we'll show you how easy the upgrade is. Um, a live backup server, going to build a live backup server and show you how that then looks different. Uh, distributed database and then finally add a node to that database. And then after that, we'll go through onto the, the threat intelligence, which um, you know, buckle yourself in because it, it, it's, it's a bit of a bit of a long one, this one. OK, so let's uh, let's let's crack on. So here we are now on the the production server, or what is going to be the production server. Whenever doing anything like this, um, it's better to be in root. In fact, you have to be in root. Okay, and we're going to change to temp directory, and then we're just going to get the file. And I've got a small HTTP server, so that's all good. So I'm going to W get that. And is that going to run really, really slow? Yeah, it's going to run exceptionally slow. So I'm just going to um, pause that for a minute and then we'll, uh, then we'll come back to it. Okay, so we've come back to it now and it seems to be running a bit quicker than it was before. So once this is downloaded, then what we're going to do is we're going to change the um, missions on the file so that it's uh, executable. And then we're going to execute it. And you'll see what it does to, to install a standalone server. Then we'll have a look at the server, have a quick look around, see what the um, sort of differences are between that and, and distributed and so on later on. Uh, and then we'll upgrade it. Okay, so we're nearly there. Okay, that's now completed. So if we do an ls, we can see it's there. And we can see that it is owned by Ruby. It's not executable at the moment. So we're going to change that. So CA9 okay. 
you missed it. Okay, and that's pretty much it. So now what we need to do is just run that. And that will install it for us. It will verify it. You can go and read the uh, license agreement if we want to, but I would suggest at this point that we're probably okay with that. Have to accept it though. And then it begins installing you can see the script running. so once the script has gone through it'll ask us to um, add the default admin username which is just admin except the default then add a password for it um, and then once you've uh, once you've accepted the 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 options like that for the password and then when it's going to run what is, is it going to run on 443 then it will go through and pull all the docker files so um, We'll just uh, I'll pause it until it gets to that part. Okay, because as, as we can see now, it's it's built that, it's prepared to unpack it, and now we get to give it our options. So oh, do we want it to run on four four three? Yes. Default user admin. Yeah, why not? Add the password for admin, and if you try and put in a simple password, it will throw its toys out the cot. Yes, and now it will go off and start pulling the Docker images, which does take some time. So uh, I'll pause it again there, um, and then we'll come back to it once it's installed. Okay, so now it's um, now it's completely installed. We just want to start the server. So yes, and now we know that we can go to this address and get onto it. So that's what we're going to do now. I'm just going to reload it because when I've done it before, I've gone back to this point and you won't accept the password because it still cached the old password. Okay, and as you can see we're in. So now we're going to have a look at the version, uh, don't worry about the license, we'll that later. Okay, and the version is 6.02. Um, so that's all good, that's installed, and that's running properly. There's 18 uh, things to update in the marketplace. So now we'll go and we'll upgrade it. So to upgrade it, we're just going to pull the upgrade script, which is just basically the next script that you would. So if you're going to get this version uh, 6.1, this is the script you get. Okay, now as that's coming down, so what we're going to do is we're going to run this on the server. It will detect that it's already got a version on it, and then it'll ask if you want to back up the, uh, the files that I showed you before, and then it will go on and upgrade the server. Um, I wish I could say more about it. That's it. I've um, done this several times now, many times in fact, and it's never had a problem. Um, so... 
once he's once he's come down, that's uh, that's what we'll do. Okay, that took a lot longer than it should have done, but now that it's down, we'll do the same again with this one. We'll make this one executable, and then we'll run it. And once it's uncompressed it, there you go, it finds that we've got an existing version of uh, Demisto on here, so I'm going to say yes to the upgrade. This is where D wants to back up your data before the upgrade starts, yes. And it'll add those files to that file location, file lib demisto data. And then it'll unpack and update it. So I'll pause again because this will take some time. Okay, so now that's finished. Um, that took a, a little bit less time than I thought it was going to do, but you can see now we've got an updated version of Git was installed. So do you want to start a server? Yes, we do. And then just given us a minute, we'll go back to our uh, our browser. It's a little bit quick there, so it's this is whilst the server starting up, it gives you that message. I'm just going to redo it again in case you've got a stale session. And then we can see immediately we can see a difference there. And now we're in. And we can see it's version 6.1. Uh, a couple of things to look at here just before we go any further. So in the advanced tab, just take a note of these, We've got the backups. There it says the artifacts and attachments are not backed up. Um, the backups directory is Demisto backup, which is what we talked about before. And then you've got the backup time there, which you can then select. Automated backups on and off. Um, but so we'll go, we'll go further into the backups afterwards. Okay, so that's a standalone server. Uh, so the next one will be distributed database. Um, and then we'll do the live backup. Okay, so on the left we have the primary, on the right we have the backup. We're going to be doing the live backup setup at the minute. So as I said before, you've got the options of the manual backup or the live backup when it comes to anything outside of just the main database or artifacts, anything like this. Um, this does provide a resilience for that, so you can still manually back it up, but to be fair, this is it's, it's almost like an active passive, although it doesn't automatically fail over should anything fail. It's a manual failover as we discussed previously. So I'm going to pull the file down to here now. Just going to copy that. To there. Okay, so now we're pulling the file down to both of them. Okay, so now they're both down, so we're going to install them. There's, um, the first one, the primary, is obviously just going to get installed the way it normally does, but the backup, DR, live backup, whichever way you want to refer to it, that has some flags when you're installing it that have to be have to be added. So for the first one, Again, we just change the ownership and sort of moving forward, what I might do now is actually already have it installed. Um, but I guess this helps as well, just in case.
Okay, so we'll just accept the the agreement on this one and set that on its way. Now there is a difference between installing six point one and six. Six goes through the whole, you know, the the Hollywood hacker um, lines going through the screen of it pulling all the Docker images. Six point one doesn't do that so it looks like it's not doing anything but it actually is so don't panic okay so now we need to look at the the flags and what we're going to do with this one is we're going to tell it to install it as a dr but not to start the server because when we come to it we need to configure the primary to see it then we're going to stop the primary we're going to start the backup and then we're going to start the primary back up that way as it comes back up it will connect and all will be right with the world um, unless I screw it up of course in which case uh, no it won't okay so when you're adding flags to the script you just gotta put the two dashes in there oh, that's wrong that simply tells it that we're making a DR and then we do the uh, put the flags in for tell it not to start the server when it when it's configured it. Okay, and away it'll go. And this is one of the things that I actually really like about this. Although the whole thing, the, the whole environment is massively complicated and massively complex which is why it's so good at what it does. Nobody's really tried to be overly clever and obfuscate the way through it. It's all actually fairly intuitive. I mean, if you take that command there, I want to install Domisto server, I want to install it as a DR, and I don't want you to start it when it's already installed. I mean, it, it literally doesn't get any more intuitive than that. Okay, so once again, I'm going to pause this because there's nothing really special to look at that you didn't see in the last one. And, um, well, frankly, my retention figures are bloody terrible for videos. So if I pause it, hopefully you won't get bored and you'll, uh, you'll watch the next part. Okay, so I did just want to draw your attention to when we're configuring the DR server, the options that you get on installation are actually slightly different. So we just do the same again for the HTTPS port. It's not connecting to an Elasticsearch database, so that's obviously no. The default is no. Are these configurations correct? Yes. And in a way it will go. And you'll notice there's no option there for username and, and password because you don't need it because we're going to copy those, um, those across from the primary. Okay, so that's now done. So we'll just let it start the server and we'll go and have a look. So now it's started, we can see that we've got the primary address there. And that's the um, that's the Docker address inside. So we're going to go to 10.06.16 and um, just put the configurations in there that we're going to need for the live backup, including we have to put a, a new key pair in for the UI so that we actually see the options for the live backup. And um, and then we'll just shut the server down because there's, there's just no point leaving it up at that point. Uh, okay, so we'll go and do that now. Okay, so here we are on the, uh, the new server and we're just going to log in. Not with that username or not. Worry about the license later. Okay, so initially, if you go to settings advanced and then backups, we don't actually see the option for the live backup, and that's because we need to actually change a, a key pair in the server configuration, which is done in about troubleshooting 
add server configuration and the configuration we need is let me just save that and now you can see you've got the live backup down here so we switch it on, it changes to pending. Now, I'm gonna put in the DNS name because it can resolve the DNS. I'm hoping I've got my fingers crossed. And that DNS name is, just let me, uh, just let me check, make sure, is XOR backup. Can't tell you how many times I've been caught out by thinking it's one thing and it's not, it's another. The rest of it is actually fairly intuitive, but I'll go through it anyway. So there's no pending actions. Um, if there's any pending actions, once it's done, you can do it that way or just let it do it itself. The port that it's going to be connecting to is 443. Trust server certificate unsecured. When it's on, it'll accept the self-signed server certificate. When it's off, it won't. It'll need a trusted certificate. Um, by default, it's on. And then use proxy if you, obviously, I mean, that if you change that to use proxy, then you're gonna need to use proxy settings further along. Um, and those settings are done again in the troubleshooting uh, section where you add a server configuration. Okay, so now we're just gonna save that. Right, so now that that's done, as you can see, the live backup will start to mirror actions after you configure the DR server and restart the production server. So we're gonna go now and we're gonna shut down the XOR instance we've got here. And that is simply Okay, so that's now shut down. And as we can see on the right hand side, we've now got the DR server is up and we have to start the DR server. Once we started the DR server, then we're gonna start the, we're gonna give it a minute just to sort its head out. Then we'll start the primary again and then they should all hook up, be happy with each other and my job is done. Do you know what? That would have been great if I hadn't been talking rubbish. So of course, what the, what we have to do as well is we have to copy the configurations across. And I can't believe I forgot that step. May or may not edit that out. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to pull everything from here, which is in a single command, uh, which actually I'll, I'll leave the link to the document from Paolo in the settings below, in the comments below, sorry. Um, and then we SCP it across to the root folder of the of the the backup. Okay, so we'll do that now. Okay, we're back on. So the link, so the link for the documentation is here. The documentation is brilliant at this part. There are some parts of documentation, like with any vendor, where they occasionally it's it's missing a little bit. Um, but there is a vendor out there. Um, whose main main colors are pink and black. And um, I mean, their, their documentation really should start with riddle me this. So it's good, it's good documentation. Okay, so we're going to, I'm not gonna lie, I'm literally gonna copy from the documentation. Copy it into notepad first because then that gets rid of the um, that gets rid of the formatting from the web page I 
Okay, and then it will crack on doing it. Now there's a couple of files that it's going to say are missing because this isn't a production server. It's not been in production. Well, it is a production server, but you know what I mean. It, it's not a production server. It's not in production. And then you can see we've got our, our tar file there. Then we need to copy the tar file to the backup. So we can do that through SCP. The reason I'm copying it to the temp file is because you are supposed to copy it root. Bear in mind that these, well, specifically mine anyway, you can install it on others, but mine are built in Ubuntu. And Ubuntu by default, in case you didn't know, um, which I didn't when I first tried to do it, um, Ubuntu by default doesn't allow root to log in. So the documentation actually says SCP, the demisto file to root at your backup server IP port hostname. Um, but you can't, and so I, therefore, I can't copy as my user, my old curling user, I can't copy that now into the root folder because I haven't got permissions, whereas, as everybody knows, you've got global read-write permissions on the temp file. Um, of course, just bear in mind, anything you copy across the temp file is gone if you have to reboot the server because the temp file doesn't retain its contents after a reboot. Okay, so now we can see it's there. So we're just gonna uh, decompress that to the root drive now as root. More letters than an alphabet. Not quite sure why my fingers aren't working today. Right, so that's now all done. So now I can go back to the point I was going to do before um, and just, uh, just got it all massively wrong. So we're gonna start the backup server first. Not without command, I keep getting it confused. Okay, so that's now started. And just to prove why I got that wrong and just to prove that I'm not a complete donut, uh, we'll just give it a minute actually, just to let them, let that come up fully. Okay, I think that's probably enough time. Wow. Okay, so now that I've finally managed to type it correctly, uh, we can see now that we've, we've started the backup and we've started the primary. So we're just gonna reload this page Okay, so now we've reloaded the page in its own time, because I think it's actually still starting in the background. Anyway, so there you go. So that's that's it. So now the live backup now is fine. 
it tells you when it was last mirrored, so that was the last time it did any kind of uh, any writing to the backup. And we're all good. Now to switch hosts, if this fails to switch hosts, you, uh, so I'll just show you actually whilst I'm here. Okay, so if we go to the backup server now, please don't let me down at this point. It's it's that, but we can't we can't get to it because it's it's dr, which I believe. So this is this is the dr page for it. Now, what we need to do to switch between the two is we need to switch hosts. Okay, now that'll start to switch hosts. At this point, if we reload this, okay, so now we've logged into it, we've logged into the backup server. What we have to do now is we have to say, make this production server. And that will begin the switching process. Yep, and all is well. So it's picked up the XOR Pry, it knows that, and it can resolve it, so it's happy. And we see we've got all the same configurations here. So that's it really, that's live backup. Anything now that you put onto the primary is gonna be on the DR. Um, it is a mirror, it will immediately mirror it. If I, um, hang on. So let's say I go to Data Available, update them all. And then, so when we come back, what we should see then is that the last mirror in action um, was, in fact, we'll, we'll try it now. So now you see we've got some pending actions there. Because we're upgrading all the, um, we're updating all the integrations on this one, now we've got pending actions to mirror it across to the other one. And that will take some time because it's also on a bit of a, a bit of a slow bandwidth as well. Um, Should be fine in its own time. Everything seems to take just that little, there you go. Everything just seems to take that little bit longer. Uh, but then that said, as we went over the minimum specifications, um, it should be noted at this point, these are not, these are not running with the, the correct specifications. So any kind of performance lagging or anything like that, that you see with these environments, isn't something that you're gonna see in a production environment uh, if you built it properly. It's just that basically I'm a cheap ass and um, I, I've got, I mean, I, I, I dread to think the oversubscription rate for my memory and uh, IOPS and compute in my VM server, which is sat downstairs somewhere at the minute smoking. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it struggles. So, but that said, I personally feel the whole thing's a bit, it's quite a lightweight program it runs very very quickly when it's got the correct specifications um and that's it so for that part now that's it that's how you build live backup switching back is exactly the same process so we go back to there switch hosts and then we switch hosts going back um it's yeah it is it is what it is that's that's done um and then We'll move on now to the, hang on, we've done the distributed database. Uh, so now we need to do the adding nodes to a distributed database. So I'll see you in that video. Okay, so now we're going to do the distributed database, which is fairly easy. We just got the same scripts that we had before. You can see it there. Uh, I've done the chmod to make it executable. 
and again like before it's just the standard uh, way of installing it running the script but with the flags to tell it what we're going to do so the first one we're going to install is the db node as you can see and that is simply tell it that we want some options DB only sort of speaks for itself, we're telling it we want DB only. The secret that we're going to have, um, so the secret has to be a 10 character password, so for ease and so on, I'm just going to do it really simple. Okay, so I don't forget later on, I look like a complete tool. And then finally, why to accept all the uh, all the defaults as we go through? Okay, so now that I'll install the database, and on the other side, we just need to install now the app server using the flags just to install an app server. The misto server, use flags. And then we're going to, for this one, because this one is the um, server only, it's, that's literally the flag we're gonna have server only and then we're going to tell it where its database is uh, what the secret is so that it knows to connect to it Ooh. And the address of that one is I think should really have uh, thought that through. And then we're going to give it the external address of this host. So the address of this server as it's connecting to that. So that's going to be the 10.0.6.16. So used to pressing space. Uh, 16. And then we're going to put the Y again so that we've got the accept all, um, all defaults. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause here whilst this does it because you want to install the database, make sure that's installed and running, and then install the, uh, the app server unless it's finished now which it could be. Or has it still got a bit to go? I think it may still have a bit to go, so I'm going to pause it now, and then we'll come back to it when we're ready to install the uh, the uh, app server. All right, so now as we can see, that's done. So that's installed, so we'll just run the script on the app server now. And then once that's done, we'll go to the app server and we'll be able to see that we've now got a remote database. And then we will add a database node to that um, to that pool, I suppose you could call it, of databases. Um, then, uh, yeah, then we'll go through deleting it. And uh, and then that's it. That's, that's it for this video. Um, the domain four is actually in two parts. I'm going to do it in two parts because, well, A, uh, nobody really watches my videos beyond four and a half minutes anyway. 
which is slightly stressful. Um, so it gives me a chance of getting the video watched. But B, because it is actually quite a large domain. So part of it is the architecture. Part of it is this, is like distributed databases, size and requirements and so on. And the other part of it is the threat management capability of XOR, which does become really, it does become really quite um, intense and quite a large subject. So I'm going to do that in a, in a separate video, which will be really imaginatively titled uh, PCSAE Domain 4 Part 2. Um, so you can watch out for that wonderful piece of cinematic uh, history. Um, so I'll just pause this whilst it does what it does, and then we'll come back to it and we'll have a look at the remote database. Okay, so now that's finished. So with some luck, we should be able to log into it. So now he's changed the password, which I forgot. Hang on, I'll remember what I'm typing now. He's changed the password because the password, when you install the app server only, the password is admin admin. Um, and then that gets to the part where you have to change the password for it. Okay, so now we're on the, the app server and we're gonna go and hopefully, all things being equal, we should see a connected remote database and that's it really so you can download the logs from that database you can see what it's using 3% CPU memory disk usage uh, and also here from this page this is where we create a node so before we do that we just need to check and make sure that the host name is populated in the troubleshooting section External host name 10.0.6.16, so that should be all good. That's what, that's what it should build it as. So we'll go back. Remote databases, and then we'll create a node. And that will just take a minute before it starts to download the script. So I'll just pause it there. Okay, so I got a little bit caught out there by the old uh, the old pop up blocker. So once that's done, you then get the option to download the script. The script is then what we're going to put onto the server that's going to become the node, and then we run the script from the node. So I'll save that, and then use WinSCP to put it onto what was originally used as the backup node. And, uh, and we'll run it from there. So once it's done, I'll um, I'll show you that. Okay, so once again, I've gone into the temp directory because uh, of the Ubuntu permissions. And as you can see, we now have the file in there, the demisto node file that was created from the Cortex instance. So now what we just need to do is we need to run that script with the flags that I'm gonna show you now. Uh, and that's just literally what it's connecting back to. And this is where we need the port 443 open because this will connect back to the app server on 443. So for registering the database. And then at which point, then you need your 50,001 for the uh, replication and the, uh, the database activity between the two. So, right, and then again, for the to tell it we're going to add some flags and then a 
the external address of the app server and accept defaults. And that will now go through and build our, our node. And then that should join the app server without any, uh, any having to restart. So you can see just how versatile it actually is. Um, you would do this, I mean, if in a, in a massive environment or I suppose not, it doesn't have to be a massive environment. If you've got lots and lots of instance, or you've got lots and lots of threat feeds, got lots and lots of things coming in, um, you are going to need to be able to expand your database. Um, at, at will basically and this you can do it so without any um any interruption to production traffic or any interruption to service you can increase your database capacity and bandwidth uh, as much as you as you see fit so um i'm gonna pause again there just to let that do that and then we'll come back to it and hopefully it'll all be registered and and i'll look like i know what i'm doing Okay, so that's now finished. Now, a little bit of a, um, a sort of an open thing now. So, when I said previously, I got it. I got it wrong pre previously. So, the address that needs to go in is the address of the node that you're creating, the external address of the node you're creating, because within the script, it's already got the address of the app server so this has been created it's now running and we can see the results okay so this is the original one that registered um, didn't register itself because it couldn't because I, I'd put the wrong address on um, and then this is the one now that's that's gone through so this is actually run from the same script so you only need to run the script again um, it gives it a different ID each time and then we can go to the to the database server if we want to and that's how you create a node that's that's the node that's created we can download the logs from it so we can see what it's doing um, we can monitor it we can see the, the CPU and the memory and the disk usage as it goes through um, yeah so that's it that's that's how you create a node and that's also <laughs> rather alarmingly how you also don't create a node um, so there you go so by accident I put the wrong IP address in and that's why that one never managed to, to register so uh, so that's it for this one now so as I say we're gonna do can do this in two parts because of the threat management side of things um, so once I'm finished doing that one I'll put that one up as well um, I'll get all the links for the um, articles that I've used so far, all the stuff for Paolo, so that you can follow along and you can use the um, the resources that are out there, um, and have a good one.